Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and I am absolutely delighted you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this one on um, July 7th in my church in Sligo, Pennsylvania. Now, Sligo is a little bitty town about 10 miles south of Clarion, and Clarion is right off Interstate 80. We're up in the, the northwest part of Pennsylvania. And the sermon I'm preaching this morning is part of a series we started uh, some weeks ago. So listen for on, on Paul's letter to the Galatians. So listen for the word of God. When I was in high school, I had an amazing English teacher. And I remember one of the books he had us read was James Agee's A Death in the Family. Now, I could close my eyes and still see the blue cover. And although I've got to admit it, I don't remember much of the story. There were a couple of lines that really stuck with me for 50 years. And since a whole bunch of brain cells have died since reading it in 1973, I looked it up to make sure I was right. Agee wrote this. How far we all come, how far we all come away from ourselves. So far, so much between, you can never go home again. You can go home, it's good to go home, but you never really get all the way home again in your life. Now, that's what A.G. wrote. And I'll tell you, it just makes sense. I mean, when, when you think about it. Because the world is constantly changing, and, and we're constantly changing, you can never really go back to what used to be, no matter how hard you try. And I'll tell you, in a, in a very real sense, that's something I experienced firsthand when I went back home to Norfolk a week and a half ago. I mean, even though I'm not an idiot, therefore I knew things had changed and were changing. I'll tell you, it's been easy to be up here about eight hours away, remembering the way it was, and then assuming that's the way it still is. But that really changed after I drove the 470 miles and saw firsthand that although you can go home, and it's good to go home, you really can't get all the way home again in your life. But you know, having said that, well, I think making those assumptions about going home and recreating the past, well, they just might be part of our nature. I mean, whether it's a desire to be comfortable, and let's face it, there's nothing more comfortable and predictable than the past. It never changes. Or maybe it's a fear of what's out there in the future, or maybe it's the bl a blending of the two. It really, it's really easy to look back, you know, to look back to a time that seemed simpler and more stable, a time when we all appeared to be on the same page and everybody seemed to share the same values and perspectives. Now, I think that's something we often do. And I'll tell you, we're not alone. Because in Paul's opinion, that's... That was what the Galatians were doing. Although I've got to admit, I think they probably in their gut had a feeling that they uh, were doing something very different. I mean, remember, based on what we've already talked about in the five week, first five messages in this series, the Galatians had turned away from what Paul taught. And I'm talking about undeserved grace from God and faith by us. They'd rejected this and substituted it uh, with a false gospel of work and law. And even though when they did it, those Galatians probably thought they were accepting something new and exciting, in the passage we're looking at this morning, Paul told them in no uncertain terms that they were actually going back to the time before they'd heard about Jesus Christ. Back to obedience instead of trust and bondage rather than freedom. In other words, they were doing the same sort of thing we often do when we look back in order to recreate something that no longer exists. Something that, that uh, distorted their expectations and their relationship with God. And since we have this in common, I think Paul wrote, what Paul wrote to them might also apply to us. And that's what we're going to be considering this morning. In other words, we're going to look at what Paul wrote to the Galatians, and then we're going to apply it to ourselves. 
And by the end, hopefully, we'll be able to avoid the unfortunate consequences of trying to move forward by looking back. And like I said, I think that's what Paul was getting at in Galatians 3, 8 through 20. You see, in this passage, I believe Paul reminded the Galatians of three things that, based on their current actions, they may have forgotten. For example, first, I believe Paul reminded the Galatians of what God had already done. Something that the Galatians had pushed aside when they started to do the same kind of thing they'd done before they'd even heard of Jesus. Paul wrote, Before you knew God, you were slaves of God that, weren't, weren't, that are not real. But now you know God, or better still, God knows you. How can you turn back and become slaves of those weak and pitiful powers? You even celebrate certain days, months, seasons, and years. I'm afraid I've wasted my time working with you. Now that's what Paul said. And let's talk about what he meant. You see, before Paul came with the gospel of undeserved grace, something that no one can earn, the Galatians were all about trying to please their empty gods. You know, to show them that the Galatians were worthy, in other words, to be as obedient as possible, because that's exactly what those weak and pitiful powers demanded. Man, they were even observing certain days and months and seasons of years. Why? Because that's what they were commanded to do. Now, that's where they were in the past, but not anymore, thanks to Christ, they were free. And that's why what they were doing was so dangerous. You see, by putting law above grace and obedience over faith, they were going back to the way it was. Something that made absolutely no sense, not after they got to know the God of grace, and the God of grace got to know them. Now, that's what God had done. And that's the first thing Paul reminded the Galatians. But that's not all, because second, he reminded them of what they'd already done themselves. I mean, not only had they heard the truth and believed, their acceptance of the message was shown in how they treated the messenger. Just listen to what Paul wrote. My friends, I beg you to be like me, just as I once tried to be like you. Did you mistreat me when I pre first preached to you? No, you didn't. Even though you knew I had come there because I was sick. My illness must have caused you some trouble, but you didn't hate me or turn me away because of it. You welcomed me as though I was one of God's angels or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is the good feeling now? I am sure if, I had been, if it had been possible, you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me. Am I now your enemy? Just because I told you the truth? You see, the kindness they showed to Paul in the past actually demonstrated their acceptance of his message. And I'll tell you, this also makes sense. I mean, give me a break. If they thought he, what he offered was just a bunch of nonsense, they, would have, they wouldn't have put up with his ailments and disabilities. Man, they'd have given him his walking papers in a heartbeat. But they didn't do that, did they? And said they treated him like he was one of God's angels or even Jesus Christ himself. You see, they treated Paul pretty well. That's what they did. And that's the second thing he reminded them. And third, he also reminded them of what they faced. In particular, the motivation of those who wanted to return them to slavery. Paul wrote, Those people may be paying you a lot of attention, but it isn't for your own good. They only want to keep you away from me so that you, so you will pay them a lot of attention. It, it is always good to give your attention to something worthwhile, even when I'm not with you. My children, I am in terrible pain until Christ may be seen living in you. I wish I were with you now. Then I could, then I would not have to talk this way. You have really puzzled me. Now that's what Paul said. And just think about what he was getting at. I mean, once they remembered what God had done for them and what they had done for his messenger, they'd realize that those who talked about law and works and, uh, works and obedience, what they were doing was not only atta an attack on the one who announced grace and faith and trust, it was actually a pathetic attempt to focus attention on themselves. 
You see, these false teachers didn't care about the Galatians, and they sure didn't care about the truth. All they cared about was themselves. And let's get real, it just doesn't make sense to trust anyone that's self-centered, does it? I mean, good night, don't be stupid. They'll tell you anything to get what they want. And they did. And that was the third thing Paul reminded the Galatians who'd taken a step back. And you know, I think, I think he'd say the same kind of thing to us. When we try to go back to a system of oughts and shoulds that promise us comfort and security, but actually result in bondage and slavery. For example, if he were with us right here and right now, I believe Paul would challenge us to remember what God has done for us. I mean, let me ask you, and feel free to say your answer out loud, do you believe that God loves you? And do you believe that Jesus Christ saved you in spite of the fact that you make mistakes? And do you believe that the Holy Spirit is right here in this place at this time? Because God's presence is everywhere. Okay, why do you believe it? I'll tell you why. It's ultimately grounded in, in what God, not us, did. It's like what Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians. We are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be. Though we, all, we once judged Christ in this way. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and he has given us the work of making peace between himself and others. Now that's what God has already done for us. And we can simply trust that it's been done. And that we need to remember. Just like based on what Paul wrote to the Galatians, we need to remember what we can do for others. And I'll tell you why that's important. You see, whether we recognize it or not, we have the ability to make an enormous difference in the lives of those around us. And again, let me ask you, do you think we should do it? You know, make a difference. Do you think we should, if we're able, do what Christ has called us to do? You know, like feeding the hungry and giving water to the thirsty. Like welcoming the stranger and clothing the naked. Like caring for the sick and comforting the prisoner. In other words, do you think we're called to love one another as we've been loved? Thank you. But why do you think this is what we've been called to do? Well, I'll tell you, I think it's the same reason that's moved believers to claim and apply these words from Paul for the last 2,000 years. Ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you. Ask him to bless them and not curse them. When others are happy, be happy with them. When they are sad, be sad. Be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel you know more than others. Make friends with ordinary people. Don't mistreat someone who has mistreated you, but try to earn the respect of others and do your best to live at peace with everyone. You see, this kind of thing we can do, and that's something else we need to remember. And finally, we need to remember what others are trying to do with those who trust in God and who feel a responsibility to others. You see, just like it was for the Galatians, there are men and women who will try to convince us that God is detached and that undeserved grace doesn't exist. And since we're alone, they'll tell us that we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world. It's all about survival of the fittest and getting what you pay for. And we need to do whatever is necessary to get what we want. And it doesn't matter if we have to lie and cheat and steal to get it. Now, that's the world that we have. Or so they'll say. But let me ask you again, is this the kind of world you want? Are these the kind of values you accept? And is this the kind of person you want to be? You see, the fact that you can say no shows you know exactly what we face. Something that Paul mentioned in his second letter to Timothy. The time is coming when people won't listen to good teaching. 
Instead, they will try to look for teachers who will please them by telling them only what they're itching to hear. They will turn from the truth and eagerly listen to senseless stories. You must stay calm and be willing to suffer. You must work hard telling the good news and, doing, and to do your job well. You see, this is, the kind, this is the kind of thing we face. And that's something else we need to remember. I'll tell you, I'm glad I went home for a couple of days. Because I saw some issues that just weren't around when I was there about three years ago. Things that just don't fit in with the memories I have from the past. You see, I now know how things are. And since, and once you know, well, you know. And frankly, I think I'm better for it. And I believe that's the case with us as we go about living our faith. I mean, just like Paul told the Galatians, we don't have to drift to ideas and values that are no longer valid with the coming of Christ. As a matter of fact, this is something we can understand when we are crystal clear about what God has done and about what we can do and about what we face. In other words, because we live in the present and, and move into the future, we can, into the future, trusting in the one who gives undeserved grace, we really don't have to look back. Amen. Well, thanks for listening to this sermon. I hope you found it meaningful. Of course, if you're around the church, and I'm talking about Sligo Presbyterian Church in the little bitty town of Sligo, Pennsylvania, uh, we're about, like I said, about 10 miles south of Clarion, and Clarion is on Interstate 80. If you're around here on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, come on by and worship with us. We'll be praying and singing and preaching. I think you'll have a good time. Of course, if you're around here on Wednesday morning at 10.30 or Thursday evening at 6.30, come on by and join in some of our Bible studies. I think you'll get a lot out of that as well. And so until I talk with you again, I want you to remember that you, my friend, you are a child of God, and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now.